It's great to see you. My name is Shauna Sylvester, and I'm the executive director of Carbon Talks. And just want to get a sense of who's been to a Carbon Talk before. And so there's a few of you for whom this is new. We always start, turn around to the neighbor, one of your neighbors, maybe somebody you haven't met yet. Just introduce yourself and tell them why you're at this Carbon Talk. So just take a moment and introduce yourself. This is my first talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> this, is talk. this is where we talk. This is where we talk. <clears throat> yeah, no, we had to get 5%, uh, sorry, 10% of ballot voters in every one of the 85 ridings of BC right, in 90 days. Every riding. Every riding. You miss one, it's all over. You miss one riding by one signature, and then the whole thing is okay. over. Okay. That always uh, gives an extra between, minute or so uh, for those that are coming 20 in. 20 and 60,000 people, so... So we for those of you who are not familiar with Carbon they, Talks, they, we are based at the Center for Dialogue. We're part of four different schools, the school, Beatty we School of Business, the School of Public Policy, the School for International Studies, and of course the Center for Dialogue itself. So, and our focus is really looking at those transitions where a low carbon economy is possible, but perhaps all the stakeholders aren't around the table or all the people aren't around the table. So we focus on trying to move from intent to action in transitioning to a low carbon economy. Um, today we are really excited to host this session. Uh, this session is really about running campaigns and winning votes. And I'm sure many of you heard in the election that we were going to be facing a transit funding referendum. And I think for some of us that came as a bit of a surprise. Um, we had been working uh, through the Center for Dialogue with a group called Moving in a Livable Region for a few months at that stage, and a number of the members are here today. And really our focus has been looking at the whole relationship between transportation and the economy, and how do we get tr sustainable transportation funding in this region. And that's really been a hard nut to crack for many, many years. So we're excited to actually Take a moment and think through some of the strategy. We are facing a referendum, whether we like it or not, and uh, so we thought we would get a couple of really bright people who have worked on referendums, who have won referendums, and get their best advice today. So I am going to say hello as well to those of you who are following us through webcast. We have a hashtag. It's hashtag BC Transpo. And at any point, if you want to Twitter, using that, you want questions to come forward, please have them fly. We've got one of my colleagues, Kian Grunendig, is going to be following the questions in the Twitter feeds, and we're going to be taking some of those questions as well. In terms of the format for today, we've uh, done it a little differently than we have in the past. We're asking each of our speakers, we're giving them each 15 minutes. So 15 minutes for Denny and 15 minutes for Bill. And then we're going into a real dialogue. And that's when we really try and get the questions that you have. And we also want you, it not just to be a bilateral. It's not just questions and answers. It's a chance for us to draw on the extensive expertise that I know is in this room right now. So I won't go on. I want to introduce, I'm very excited. We've, we've brought Denny up from um, Los Angeles. Denny Zane uh, is the former mayor of Santa Monica. He was also the lead for Move LA in 2007, and that brought together business, labor, and environmental leaders and organizations with the goal of raising significant new funding for Los Angeles County's transit system. This coalition helped to lead the campaign for something called Measure R, sales tax, which we'll learn a little bit more about. And proved to be a powerful force in getting Measure R on the 2008 ballot and winning its passage with the result that LA has embarked on an ambitious build out of its transportation system. So Denny gives us an example of what it is to win a trans transit referendum. So Denny, I'm going to go to you and then I'll have a chance to introduce Bill later, but let's enable you to give us your 15 minutes of wisdom. All right, well, I know exactly why I'm here. I am here because nobody can believe that L.A., L.A., 
the automobile capital of the known universe would ever vote more than two-thirds to pass a sales tax measure, more than two-thirds of which is invested in transit. It really is a mojo moment. And it, there is a palpable sense of opportunity now uh, in Los Angeles County as a result. But it wasn't always that way. This is how it really all began, although I think I want to back up a little bit and just talk about uh, the experience of, of traffic crystallizing before your eyes. You know, Los Angeles is famous for its traffic congestion, um, and it's always been rather like rough slush, uh, hard, more difficult in some parts of the county and less in other parts of the county, but... You know, you still moved, and it was you groused about it, and at least you got a chance to listen to the music and what have you. For some people, it was the only real opportunity. Um, but there was a day when slush turned to ice, crystalline, and you could see the future, and it didn't look good. Um, I remember it as um, leaving my home, going to work for just the mile um, I needed to take to my office, um, where I crossed the, up the 10 Santa Monica Freeway, and everything was stopped on the other side of the freeway. It was like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I thought, there must be an accident somewhere. The next day, it was the very same. And the day after that, it was the very same, and I kept thinking, I can't have an accident like that every day. <laughs> and then you started hearing filtering in the media, and people are talking and yammering about What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? There's something new going on. And indeed, there was. Los Angeles County was rapidly approaching gridlock. And it knew that that was bad stuff because the economy was so dependent upon our mobility and the ability of the workforce and goods and everything else to move about. But then we learned something even worse was that L.A. Metro had zero billion dollars for new projects in the future. They had the money to operate and maintain, to some degree, the existing system, but no money for new capacity. And we knew that all the projections said that three million new people were going to live here, more people were going to live here in 30 years. So that was like Chicago came here today. <laughs> and we're in gridlock. And what would happen if Chicago came here today and we were in gridlock? They'd all want to go home. So it was a world of hurt, I think, looking forward. But happily, there was um, one bright light at that moment, and that was that the, that the mayoral leadership in Los Angeles was, had a long history um, and was very devoted to a transit program if it could be made to happen. The conundrum in California is that there is only one place to get money, and that's the voters. Now, you don't have that conundrum. You may have um, a referendum in spite of that, but for California, every, every revenue source must be approved by voters, and virtually everyone, anything that specifies as a use, must get two-thirds vote. Now, that's a crazy legacy. I'll explain to some of you on, um, on a, as an aside later if you're really interested. But suffice it to say, that makes every political leader think like there's no hope. There's no hope. Even ambitious uh, transit agendas like that envisioned by Mayor Villaraigosa, who up here in the left-hand corner, have, you know, you look at that two-thirds vote and you go, oh, my God, it's just, you know, how can you do that? Well, the way you do it um, was you have to really uh, convene a smart coalition. And you know what it turns out? There's a lot of smart people around. There's a lot of smart people in your business community, a lot of smart people in the labor community, and a lot of smart people in the environmental community who know that there is no functioning effective economy without a good transportation system, that you need that system to be diverse, to, to create choices for people. You cannot rely upon one singular system and expect um, you're not going to overwhelm it at some point in time. Um, and they know that our environmental quality depends upon those choices as well. Air pollution in L.A. County is like, it's like probably where we're most famous for. And that's fundamentally about mobile sources and fundamentally, therefore, about 
uh, automobiles and trucks and trains and boats and planes. So people know that. People know that going forward. But you gather people together, and what you find is they're willing to consider working together on this, which is most fundamental. So we gathered a meeting of the business community, the labor community, the environmental community. We invited 35 leaders, 35 organizations from the top business leadership, the top labor leadership, and the top environmental leadership in the county, and 34 showed up. The one that didn't show up had a conference of her own. So that really was a key indicator from the beginning that we had an opportunity to work together. It was kind of amazing. The labor guy said, we had this meeting in the chamber, they said, we've never been here. <laughs> the next meeting we had at the Labor Federation's businesses and the business guy said, we've never been here. And the environmentalists had never been to either place. <laughs> People really didn't know each other. They had been at loggerheads on multiple issues, but never had really been convened before. And this was an issue that could convene them. And we were the ones who took the risk and called the meeting thinking, well, maybe nobody shows, but you know what? we got to try. And so out of that meeting came this meeting right here where we had dialogue about our choices. And it was remarkable how crystalline the choice, the best choice became. A sales tax was the only measure that could raise enough money to matter and get enough political support among the electorate to actually approach the two-thirds. And this measure, Measure R, was broken down this way. And I would say that the key program here is to, is to think about covering the basics but also having special major projects in each part of the county. This, is, this was our division. You'll, if you add this all up, you basically find that about two-thirds is going to transit, either as capital or as operated money. I mean, we've already built the freeway system, right? So. And we won. 67.8%. It was like a Hail Mary, really. And it was a key part of that moment was that it was on an election day. And this is really one of the reasons that we were urging and pressing Metro to move forward now, is we knew that in the election that was coming in 2008 when Barack Obama would be on the ballot in a city like LA, which has become very uh, democratic in its registration, that this was when a high turnout would be, would be there and when the voters most likely to support it would come to the polls. That, that picture there I think has uh, two mayors and probably three future mayors in it not counting my son, who is just over to the left out of the picture. So maybe it would have had four. <laughs> this was what it looked like in 2008 before the measure. Now, I want you to remember that in 1990, 18 years before this, there was zero rail transit in L.A. County. Zero. We had a bus system, but no rail cap at all. And this is what had been built from 1990 to 2008. Not bad. I mean, it's beginning, to, it's beginning to make the bare bones of a system. And then we started to add Measure R, which is um, the dotted lines, which you might not be able to see, but you can get a sense of it, it is it really kind of doubles the rail transit system from what was in 2008 and creates a much higher level of connectivity. That's what's under construction now or soon to be. Everybody is thinking about Measure R2 now. I mean, our success in building coalition and sustaining it and winning voter support is such that even the most contrarian Metro board members, you know, longstanding opposition is now thinking about um, wanting to lead the next measure, thinking about what sorts of uh, investments um, his district needs because people have seen that the voters really want to build out a system that makes a difference. This is what we expect will happen after the, uh, what will be approved, we think, after the 2016 um, election, when we think we will have even a better prospect than we had in 2008. Our coalition is firm, strong, working together, and the Metro board members are, frankly, more united than ever. This was the system we had about 65 years ago before it was torn up, <laughs> right? Uh, this one's even a little more robust now, huh? Pacific Electric Railway. It used to be famous 
L.A. was built around its rail system. It actually turns out to be a big advantage because we still have a lot of unused rail corridor that we can uh, build new lines on. The Exposition light rail line from downtown Los Angeles to Santa Monica under construction now, and it's a very exciting opportunity, is on an old corridor that was part of this system. Our format for success, there is simply no doubt that having a key executive leadership like uh, Mayor Villarigosa, who strongly supports this, was crucial. Absent that, it's very hard for people to believe you can win, especially when you need two-thirds. And, you know, having a political leadership, it, it isn't that he's out in front of the cameras all the time. He wasn't. In fact, he understood politicians are not what people want to see. But politicians have to, you know, keep the coalition together, they have to raise the money for the campaign because they're the ones with the clout to raise the money, the reach. And you have to build a seriously diverse coalition. This is just an example of some of the logos of entities on our coalition. And believe me, it's everybody. I mean, it's, you know, it's Chambers of Commerce and L.A. Business Council and L.A. Business Federation and Valley Industry and Commerce Association and San Gabriel Valley Economic Partnership and so on and so forth. L.A. County Federation of Labor, L.A. Orange County Building Trades Council, iron workers, electric workers, laborers, operating engineers, Sierra Club, Coalition for Clean Air, so on and so forth. And we're actually expanding our coalition now to build the faith community into um, a key role because they have reach into the constituencies that's very profound. Formula for success. Well, in our case... You know, you can't always prescribe for other communities. But we knew that the plan had to be big enough to win two-thirds because you had to get strong vote in every part of the county. It wasn't going to be any good at all to win very well along the Wilshire Corridor where the subway was if you didn't also win well in Long Beach. It had to add up to two-thirds. You didn't have to get two-thirds everywhere, but, you know, if you're going to get 75% in the city of L.A., you better get... 65% in the rest of the county. Um, and that's not exactly right. It's about, we're about 72, 67, 72, 66 um, city, county, rest of the county. And it was a pretty strong vote. But how do you do that is not only getting constituencies and leaders from all parts of the county, but you also have to cover the basics. Everybody knows state of good repair, you know, improved uh, high occupancy vehicle program, Improved interchanges. Freeways matter. We're not going to build a new one, but freeways matter. You've got to invest in that. You've got to invest in the boulevards. You've got to give local governments the tools they need to address the local, highly localized conditions. They're not really regional. But then you also have to have a plan with something special in every part, every significant geographic part of the county. So what you would see here is that almost every part of the county has major rail transit in it. Um, and that's a crucial part, ultimately, of winning. Long Beach is not going to vote for a Wilshire subway, but it is going to vote for enhancements to the blue line and the green line. So you have to be thinking, you know, how you're organizing your vote that way. That's part of your program. Of course, all sorts of other things matter. Timing really matters. You know, high turnout matters for, ma for, for funding measures and investment measures. So find an election where you've got a high turnout. Raising serious money. Four million dollars was what uh, was raised, mostly spent on television, radio, and direct mail. Um, that's partly because in an 08 election, um, you know, the labor movement and others are already doing a lot of get out the vote operation because of the presidential election. So, you know, you're grafting your GOTV basically on other efforts. You need to have a crackerjack polling and media consultants. I mean, you know. Polling is very difficult and complex. I understand you know that already. <laughs> you know, you, um, getting a valid sample is the crucial. You know, much less about what's the question. Is it a smart question? Is it a prejudice? And not that that doesn't matter. But the fundamental is, you know, figuring out how to get a truly representative sample so that, it, so that the answers you're getting reflect what, what, who goes to the polls on election day. And that's trickier than we think as people shift from one media to the other, as they're doing cell phones and landlines and emails. You know, it's just a lot of people not answering polls, and who the hell is that now? Do we know the demographics of that? 
um, it's a tricky set of questions. And so they have to be good, experienced, and know how to adjust for those kinds of things. Our polling was actually quite on the money. You know, we predicted 69% yes and got 67.8. That was pretty good. Effective earned media, that's pre press, basically. And effective field in GOTV. And I got that highlight in color because most of ours was grafted on uh, in, by support from other campaigns that were going on. I want to add something here that I think will enhance our future um, efforts because we will be on the ballot in 2016. The big new idea after the election, we woke up, you know, it's past 30 year revenue stream, all this new transit. 30 years? 30 years? Oh my God, that's a long time. How do you accelerate a project list like that? Well, actually, it's very easy conceptually. You borrow against your revenue stream. Really, the question is can you find big enough loans with good enough terms to make it worth your while? If it costs too much to borrow, you don't want to do it. But if you are able, then how do you, then, you know, what you can do is accelerate it. We could build our 30 year program in 10 years. Woo! Lower construction costs, earlier benefits, you know, show and tell, promises made, promises kept much quicker. You know, generation that pays also gets to use the system. How wonderful would that be? Um, you know, so we took it to the federal government. We said the federal government should be a smart lender, not just a big spender. You should, you should create a program that would create something like a line of credit with very close to zero interest instead of all the major grant programs that you give. In fact, if you gave us what would be functionally a grant for the interest, you would give less money and we would build more because we could do multiple projects concurrently, right? 10 years rather than 30. And they would cost less because we'd avoid 20 years of inflation. Well, the federal government thought that's a pretty good idea. And this is an August gathering of the uh, chair, of Senator Barbara Boxer. You probably don't know these people, but we all do. It's uh, leader of the National Chamber of Commerce, leader of the National Labor Movement, Senator Boxer, California senator in charge of the Senate Committee on Transportation, Environment, and Public Works, um, Mayor Villaraigosa, Mayor uh, Mesa, uh, Smith, from Republican mayor from Mesa, Arizona, and um, chair of the Assembly Transportation, all going, we really like this smart lender thing. And it got in the bill, and it's happening. And so... Now, we tried to do another Measure J to extend Measure R to 60 years. And because of a lower voter turnout in that election, we fell just short, 66%. But that was twice the voter said, we really like this. And that's what really has created momentum now. We, in, in defeat comes the, the realization on the part of every elected official in the county that the voters everywhere want to do this. They all know that we all benefit from smart transportation investments. Now we have a new mayor. Path forward, we've got to continue. Um, we have another federal program that we're working on that will enhance the smart lender efforts on the federal government. We're pondering a statewide measure to lower the, cost, to lower the voter threshold to 55 percent. We have another Measure R2 that we're talking about. Measure R2 is Another half cent sales tax, I believe. That's what we're proposing. A 60 year program, we think, because 66.1 was indic indicative of receptivity in a low turnout election. So we think that LA County, after 2016, it will be look out. Because, you know, I mean, LA is at the crossroads of the world economy. It's got Asian economy, it's got the Northwestern economy, it's got the Latin American economy, it's got the Atlantic European economy kind of right, right in the center. You know, our big liability is we always had the worst transportation system. But now we're going to have the best transportation system. And you know what? We already got the best weather. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Before you start, Bill. I want to give a chance to introduce Thank you me. properly. For those of you that didn't know, I just want to make a, a note that um, Jeff Meggs, who worked on the Olympics referendum, is sick as a dog in bed and apologizes profusely for 
for not being here, but I think Bill might be able to cover off a, a couple of things related to the Olympics referendum as well. So um, it's, it's a pleasure, actually. I've known Bill for years, and um, while we may not always be on the same side of issues, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce you, Bill. Bill is the president of West Star Communications, and I'm not sure many of you know this, but the whole anti-HST campaign, whether you agreed with it or not, was really mastermind by Bill and a few others, but Bill was really uh, the key person on the Fight HST campaign. Uh, he has been a political commentator for years. I'm sure you've seen his articles on 24 Hours. You've probably heard him being one of the key people almost any news channel goes to during election campaigns as a commentator. He also writes for the Tai uh, online magazine. And as I mentioned, he's the head of West Star Communications, which is a, a strategy and communications consulting firm providing services for labor, business, nonprofits, and government for the last 13 years. Uh, he also served as the communications director for the BC Federation of Labor. Bill, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks very much, and thanks, Denny. That was uh, inspiring. If you can do it in L.A., I'm sure we can do it here in Vancouver. Uh, <clears throat> notwithstanding, we don't have your weather at all. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about, primarily about the HST campaign, a little bit about the STV campaign, which is probably what Sean was referring to. Uh, and uh, unlike Danny, I was very happy that uh, in the first STV referendum, single transferable vote electoral system, uh, my group managed to stop it because it didn't get the 60% majority it needed. So you can be on both sides of those narrow wins. Uh, but just briefly, as, as many people in the room will know, on June 26, 2009, then Premier Gordon Campbell surprised BC by introducing uh, the HST or announcing the HST, which is an additional was an additional 7% harmonized sales tax, combining with the 5% BC sales tax, and that 12% combined HST was going to apply and did apply to hundreds of services that were never taxed that way before. On August 26, 2011, two year, a little over two years later, British Columbians voted 55% to 45% in a province-wide binding referendum to kill the HST after a two-year grassroots campaign led by Fight HST, which is where I was the strategist and Bill Vanderzam, the former right-wing social credit premier, was the leader, uh, to extinguish the tax that shifted $2 billion a year from businesses onto the backs of consumers. Big business and the B.C. government spent a combined somewhere between 15 and $25 million to defend the HST with a massive ad campaign and absolutely no financial disclosure. Um, still a sore point. And uh, we spent about $250,000 in total. So we were outspent about 100 to 1, somewhere around 100 to 1, 40 to 100 to 1. And now the HST is gone. So I'm going to try and talk about what happened between 2009 and 2011. Uh, I am a, yep, I did it, okay. I am a PowerPoint neophyte who's very nervous about PowerPoint. <coughs> Bill Gates can't make it work, how can I? Um, I should also note that I work as a consultant for two unions directly affected by this uh, public transit referendum, the Unifor and formerly Canadian Auto Workers, Locals 111, which is bus drivers, and 2200, which is mechanics, C-bus maintenance, and other workers. But this is solely my uh, presentation here and my responsibility. So there's some valuable lessons we learned from both these, success or these successful referenda, the, the two in the STV and also the HST. Uh, as Sean has mentioned, unfortunately, Councillor Meggs is not able to attend. Uh, I was a little bit involved in the 2003 Winter Olympic Games, which I think was, if I remember right, it was the first time an Olympics had gone to a referendum and successfully so. So I'm not going to address that much, but I'll, I'll try and answer questions later. So I want to start by uh, emphasizing the paramount importance of strategy uh, with a completely unrelated example, and it's from the summer, not the Winter Olympics. In the 1960s, Dick Fosbury was a very unsuccessful high jump athlete. He just couldn't make the grade. Uh, and at that time, jumpers went up like this, head first, um, feet, oh, sorry, yeah, went over the bar, feet first, face up like this. Fosbury just wasn't very good at it. So he invented a completely new approach, which some of you may remember or heard of, called the Fosbury flop. And he raced up to the bar at great speed, took off on his right foot, twisted his body, and he went over the bar head first with his back to the bar, a completely radical departure. That looks like this. That was the 1968 Olympic Games. He absolutely changed the sport in Mexico City in those Olympics, and despite skepticism from judges and coaches, he cleared every height up to 2.2 meters without a miss, and then achieved a personal record of 2.24 meters and won the gold medal. By 1980, 13 of the 16 Olympic finalists were all using the Fosbury flop. So, what Fosbury really did, in my view, was to take a page from the great strategist of war, Sun Tzu, 
and develop a strategy to win based on the circumstances he faced. With the Fight HST campaign, we had a very similar challenge. We needed to find a strategy first that would win and then find the tactics that would allow that strategy to be successful. And that was the same with the no BCSTV campaigns as well. That's what anyone in favor of funding public transportation must do. And I want to talk about this, and if there's anything you take out of this whole session from me, it's the difference between strategy and tactics. It's so critical. It's easy to say, and it's sometimes difficult to understand. Tactics are the means to the end. Strategy defines the end. Or as uh, another military strategist, Klaus von Clausewitz, put it, strategy is art, tactics are science. And the most important thing I can say from the Fight HST campaign, another referendum, tactics are not strategy. Rallies, petitions, media events, news conferences, lawn signs, TV, print, radio ads, these are all tactics. The Citizens Initiative petition, which we had to launch in order to get a referendum in the first place, was a tactic. It was not a strategy. It was a tactic. The strategy is how you win a set contest. In this case, coming up at some point, whenever we figure it out, uh, is the, the public f uh, transit funding referendum by convincing majority to vote in favor. And the strategy is how you defeat your opponent's arguments, you overcome your own campaign, their, their campaign, I should say, and you neutralize their natural advantages and your own weaknesses. So tactics are the means to the end, and strategy defines that end. Strategy isn't what you do, it's why you do it. So I have to say that while uh, the, the Metro Vancouver TransLink Mayor's Council uh, and others have expressed, some of them in this room, have expressed their extreme opposition to this referendum, at Fight HST we had to work like hell just to get a referendum, and that was to get a non-binding referendum with very onerous rules. Uh, which were subsequently uh, watered down by Premier Campbell. Signing up 705,000 individual voters one at a time is a phenomenal task, let alone doing it in 85 ridings in 90 days, and you can't miss one riding. If you don't make the 10% in one riding by one signature, the whole thing goes out the door and it's failed. And as Denny notes, they, they, they did a very good job and still lost. We came within 600 signatures of the whole thing falling apart uh, in Abbotsford South, actually. Uh, but we made it, so that was good. So I encourage everyone to stop whining about this referendum. Accept it as a democratic opportunity. I had to fight like hell. Bill Van Der Zandt, Chris Delaney, everybody else, all the thousands and thousands of volunteers. We had almost 7,000 canvassers to get those signatures across the province uh, because an elitist view that people don't know enough to vote the right way will sink this faster than anything. So the task at hand, like defeating the HST, which was supported by both government and business, or an STV electoral system recommended by a citizen's assembly of ordinary folks is a challenge. Uh, the first step, though, is to realize that winning this referendum is entirely possible. I am completely and utterly convinced this is a winnable referendum and that with the right combination, and as some of the things we've learned from Denny and we'll learn from others, it's totally possible. A lot of right-wing anti-tax groups, others have made it look like no tax initiative can succeed, and Denny's already showed us one that did. In the fall 2012 elections in the United States, 70% of all transit referendum passed. Not failed, passed. That's not just one referendum, that's, 20, that's about 20 of them. Uh, and so 70% passed. That's from the Center for Transportation Excellence, and you can look a lot of the results up. And we saw what happened, of course, in LA in, in 2008. So erase impossible from your mind and make victory possible. Um, I just had to get one picture of myself in here. Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, so this public transportation referendum starts with a lot of advantages that the Fight HST campaign did not have. First of all, there will be a referendum. The Premier's promised it. Todd Stone, the Transportation Minister, has promised it. There will be a referendum. That was not something that we could count on at all. Secondly, there are hundreds of thousands of commuters who have a daily direct stake in the results of this referendum. They want to see better transit. They want to see more funding so they can get to and from work or school. And we know exactly where they are and how we can get their votes because they need that commuting. That, all those people who are commuting, we can find them every day of the, of the year. Uh, third, at least so far, the B.C. government is not inalterably opposed to the referendum passing as it was with the HST. The government ran a campaign against us, as did big biz, or most big businesses. And fourth, it's still very possible to influence the B.C. government to support a positive vote 
and formulate a fair referendum question, which I think will make a significant difference. So if we can get some of the factors that LA enjoyed and have some support from the mayor's council, from the premier, from government, from political parties, et cetera, I think our odds go up very, very much to do that, although you can still win without it. Um, there's another huge advantage that uh, this public transportation referendum does share with the Fight HST campaign. People who don't normally agree can come together in common cause to win. I spent at least two or three years trying to get rid of Bill Van Der Zem as Premier. Uh, I, and I mean a lot of time and a lot of money. And uh, I worked my ass off trying to get rid of him. And I just used to say that when we turned around in debates, and he, he laughed a lot at it, but it was true. Um, and I spent even more time working with him to get rid of the HST, which was a lot more fun. Uh, another example at the, at the no BCT, uh, BCS TV campaign, I actually brought together in the same room, shaking hands, exchanging business cards, Jack Monroe, the former president of the IWA, the Woodworkers Union, and city councillor Andrew Reimer, probably one of the best known environmentalists. Then. And they're, they're having a good chat. So I think, wow, I've got to go to the UN. I, I really got really to do something else here. This is, this is good diplomacy. So anyway, surpri showing surprising cooperation and that politics truly make for strange bedfellows is a big deal on these kind of things. And that's totally possible. Public transit advocates, even in this room, we've got students, we've got developers, we've got unions, businesses, uh, the political left, center, and right can all be represented. There's room for everyone on this bus. So the challenge is to redefine what people think about this referendum. It is not, or if this referendum is simply an opportunity to pay more taxes and give more money to TransLink, then it will surely fail. If this referendum instead is an opportunity to improve bus service, SkyTrain, CBus, provide more night bus service, reduce traffic congestion by giving drivers a chance to leave their vehicles at home, and cut air pollution at the same time and improve our quality of air and quality of living for a very modest cost, then it will win. How do we do that? We have to have the right value proposition. People are not opposed to paying money for services they need. They do that every day. But they want to see, as Denny has said, they want to see tangible results. They don't want their money to go to something they didn't agree to, and they don't want it wasted. So the public transit value proposition is critical to success. But investing in public transit is decidedly not a radical idea. Public transit is what makes the great cities of the world great, whether it be Paris, or London, New York, maybe even Toronto. Um, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, <laughs> They all depend on public transit to make them work, and without it, they would be lost. So that's one thing. But here is what may be a radical idea. That's why I wanted to use the radical tag. Uh, this referendum cannot be soft sold to drivers. Uh, we've seen this fail in other places. We, we know that it, has, it can be a real mistake. The key audience, the winning majority, is the combination of existing daily transit users and part-time transit users who would like to take the bus or SkyTrain or C-Bus more often but can't because of the time constraints and the fact that it's just not efficient enough. Transit users must see the concrete benefits and decide to vote for them. The hardcore anti-transit drivers are already a lost cause. And apparently so is the Canadian Taxpayers Federation because Jordan Bateman, their BC director, wrote this week that giving TransLink more tax dollars is like giving a pyromaniac a fresh box of matches. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. <clears throat> You also have to be constantly in the news, and nobody better than Bill Vanderzen for that, with a little, with a little help from me. Uh, the Fight HST campaign had extremely limited resources, funds, no money for advertising until the actual referendum, uh, a pittance compared to government and big business. So as Denny said in his presentation, earned media is just critical, and you need a constant barrage of newsworthy stories in support of better public transit. We have to explain the problems, and then we have to explain the solution clearly, which is to pass this referendum. And if you can sign Bill Vanders in up, I'd do it. However, as Churchill said, however beautiful the strategy, you should occasionally look at the results. And a lot of people forget that. Uh, it's another reason why Fight HST was very successful and also no BCS TV. We were constantly reevaluating our strategy. We were reacting to our opponents. We were always attempting to be ahead of them. And uh, we followed the other dict. I've got all my, uh, all my German military strategists in one presentation. Field Marshal von Moltke famously said, no battle plan ever survives contact with the enemy. <laughs> Losing campaigns never understand that. So just a couple more details and I'll wrap up. 
Uh, for the 2009 No BC STV campaign, we had 12 volunteers, and we spent almost all our $500,000 budget on TV advertising, total air war. Our opponents had thousands of volunteers, and they bought thousands of lawn signs and TV ads because they had a lot more money to us, but we won 60% to 40%. Two years later, in the 2011 Fight HST campaign, we had over 7,000 volunteers and just $250,000, and we spent most of it on lawn signs. Number one thing I got during the previous campaign on the BCS TV was people would call and say, you're going to lose. You don't have any lawn signs. Those guys have hundreds of thousands of lawn signs. You have no lawn signs. When are they coming? We're not buying lawn signs. You're going to lose. <laughs> we bought TV. Um, we won. And our opponents, of course, spent, you remember the famous stick men TV ads and print ads and ads with business people saying how good the HST was for them but not necessarily for consumers. And we won that, as I said before, 55-45. So TV ads versus lawn signs, those are both tactics determined by the strategy. So lastly, take my advice as if it's part of the Pirates Code from Pirates of the Caribbean. What I have to say more like guidelines than rules. Let's go out and win this, this public transit referendum because I think and I believe that Vancouver needs and deserves better public transit. Thanks a lot. Thank you both very, very much. Um, a lot of food for thought there. So what we want to do now is open it up to a real discussion and dialogue. Um, and uh, so I'm going to try and keep track of hands and also for Twitter questions coming in. So if you are on uh, Twitter, uh, BC Transpo, hashtag BC Transpo. So who's got the first question? Here we go. I've got one, two, and three. So. Uh, first thing I wanted to point out is that we do have weather in Vancouver. <laughs> I'm hip. <laughs> Come back anytime. I love Vancouver. What do you mean? Um, I'm curious friend. what you did with your polling. Uh, Bill's talked a bit about what they did with theirs. Can you elaborate a bit in strategic terms? Yeah, polling has principally three functions. First uh, is before election polling to assess your prospects and to um, help you define the question. Um, what you really want on a ballot measure, you want voters to be, to be uh, seeing a ballot proposition um, that does well when you poll on it. And so that helps to shape your program. It's, uh, it's, it's really quite rather unavoidable. Um, and so that's one thing. Um, the second is that you want it to help you uh, define your message in the course of the campaign. Um, every moment has its own kind of zeitgeist, I guess, or prevailing concerns, I might say, that, that are you know, what's really on the public's mind. And you have to try to, and what polling does is try to help you um, understand that and tap into it um, in ways that, um, that, so you can express your proposition in ways that will resonate um, with what voters want um, and want to support. Uh, a third thing is that it'll help you, um, and that, that's sort of a television proposition, the sort of mass media proposition. A third thing though, and it depends upon your budget, is it'll help you uh, define your message to submarkets. And submarkets are markets you might reach on a more targeted basis, like with direct mail or in cable television, which in the case of California is franchise districts around. So, you know, different communities have different tele, uh, cable television operators, and you could buy, you know, off of each of those operators. So, you know, direct mail, cable outlets, and, uh, and local print media and stuff. Um, you know, the, the, the folks of, in, in our case, of Torrance are not politically or philosophically uh, that much like the folks of Santa Monica are. They have, they have somewhat different priorities and, and philosophies. Um, and you want them to, to be able to appreciate the proposition. You presumably have shaped the proposition to appeal to both, um, and you want them to know that. And so you have to have the polling helps to shape your message to submarkets. Just a yeah. short point on polling. Uh, we did a lot of polling in the STV campaign in 2009 and understood why people were concerned about the STV. It was a confusing system. In 2011, the, the provincial government funding, they funded uh, 250000 to pro and con. 
we were expressly banned from polling. We were not allowed to use any of that money for polling. So I think that tells the story. And you can read about polling and how it didn't work too well in the NDP campaign in my columns today. Great, thanks. Please introduce yourself as you uh, ask your question. Uh, Bob Ransford. A specific question, Denny, about your coalition and the, uh, the, fu the funding behind it. I noticed up in the uh, logos that you had there, there was at least four transit-related companies. I saw up there, URS, Qit, uh, Cubic, and and Siemens, did you get criticized for having those kinds of companies that had a direct interest in it, funding it? Um, there are two sets, distinct sets of operation. One is our nonprofit activity unrelated to specific election things. And then there are, and that's a, a funding source that's diverse, it includes engineering companies and labor unions and foundations and so on and so forth. And then the funding for the proposition itself which doesn't come to Move LA, but to a separate committee created for that purpose, uh, is, is sort of is, is different. Um, but no, we didn't get uh, criticism that there were um, entities that would directly benefit. And had we, we would have said, every entity here will directly benefit from this proposition. Um, and I think the fact that there were, that they had a lot of company, that there were lots of other entities, helps to uh, bring that message home. Okay, we have five questions coming up, so I just want to let you know who's coming. Tiffany? Okay. Right there. Right there. Cynthia. Cynthia. Michael, we're going to go to Twitter with Keenan. And then... So my name is Tiffany Klange. I'm the Executive Director of the Students' Union of Vancouver Community College, and we recently um, were part of a uh, Metro Vancouver referendum from students to um, increase our U pass, our universal transit pass fees. So I know it can happen. And I'm going to ask kind of a uh, on the fly strategy question. I'm wondering, as an outsider um, to BC, who uh, I'm wondering your take on uh, what happened in the provincial election recently, where it's pretty commonly known that British Columbians got to the ballot box and for whatever reason decided that they got they were afraid for the change. They didn't want to change. And so with that in mind, with a major political upset where British Columbians didn't do what everybody thought and go for a big change, is this the environment to be having a referendum that would be um, a huge change for transit? Uh, I think that there are, that there are ground, good grounds for being skeptical about that proposition, but I wouldn't take one election as dispositive on the question. I think there are, uh, um, you know, there are moments in time um, that where, I mean, I think there were some issues that occurred just prior to that election related to energy and oil and stuff that might have had a uh, LNG, that might have had a significant effect upon the election on who turns out and it might have transformed some of uh, attitudes about who should be making decisions. Um, so. Uh, and, I, and that sort of thing actually, uh, and I've only heard it described, um, could very well be a, you know, have a very significant effect upon an electorate uh, like that. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume that the, that, the same, that the electorate remains as alarmed as it might have been at that point in time. My guess is, I mean, I think winning any kind of tax measure is always a challenge. Um, and that the key is being able to show the program that you're going to invest in and show uh, the broad community that is beneficial for your economy, for your environment, and for their convenience, um, and for their choices, and for their local community. Because that's what they will want to care about. They want to see it you know, fairly specific on a measure like that. Bill? No, it's fine. What I'm going to do, we have a number of questions. We're going to group them, so I'm going to put you to work, Danny and Bill. If you can keep track of the questions, we're going to take three right now, and then we'll come back and al allow you to answer those, and then we'll take the next three. Okay, I'm trying to prioritize what's most important, but one of the big things is, is the geographical and economic differences between L.A. and that time period in Vancouver. But I think I'm going to focus on TransLink's um, reputation. They're going to be coming from a way back. I mean, when you look at the mistakes that have been made by TransLink, the, uh, I mean, for the man and woman on the street, a lot of it's just people are laughing at them in terms of not being able to use your bus pass for, your, for rapid transit. And 
also you're, you're seeing um, situations where people have been lobbying TransLink to allow people with disabilities to be able to uh, use the service at a reduced rate or at least um, be able to uh, bring somebody along with them to be able to get on and off the system. Mm -hmm. um, you could also get a lot more people using the transit system. If you're a family, you have to understand that people are spending more than 50% increase for their food, just for food. So when they have to take two adults and four children to go to the beach on the weekend, they're going to take their car. You're not going to get the people out of their car if you keep increasing the rates, especially when you have an election and there's, oh, no increases, no increases. As soon as government gets in, bang, you've got another increase. A, so number, you've got a, long way back a number of questions there. Thank you, Cynthia. Michael. Thank you. Denny, it, uh, as somebody who was born and raised in Los Angeles and escaped when he was 20, uh, I, I hear a foundation for change that occurred, uh, and it's the one that you described uh, uh, initially. It's that the county had reached gridlock. That's not true here. Uh, and so I'm trying to understand, I mean, that really strikes me as the imperative for, uh, for the successful vote in, in Los Angeles. But if that's not true here, then, and we're giving away, you know, saying the drivers are gonna, are gonna vote no, uh, how, what's, what's the, the alternative strategy that uh, that we can use to, uh, to, to build this, and I take it from both of you. So the last question before we wrap up this section is from Twitter. So we have at Mario Conseco, and the question is, a referendum is happening, what will the question be? He's there. <laughs> Sorry, Mario. <laughs> the question is, Sorry. Or Mario could ask it, but uh, <laughs> a referendum is happening. What will the question be? Okay, so we have TransLink's reputation, gridlock, without gridlock. Do we have the imperative, and what will the question be? You go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, 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 You're a guest. Um, well, I won't talk about the, uh, well, no, the, yeah, we'll talk about TransLink reputation. I mean, I mentioned that. There's no question that it's going to have to be addressed by TransLink and by the government and by whatever coalition is formed in favor of the, of the proposition. So it's going to have to be addressed. The government has talked about changing governance. That may or may not happen. It may or may not happen before the referendum. We don't know when the referendum is and we don't know what the question is. But we do know it's going to happen by the municipal elections at the latest. So that leaves a bit of time and also potentially legislative session in the spring. So we don't know where that's going to go. But, but it's pretty key to me, critical to me, that if TransLink takes the lead on this, it'll be a huge problem. I, I, I already said that. The geographic differences, um, let's face it, you can drive your car downtown and park on the street, and it's not that hard to do. It, that is not L.A., and so I think that's a key difference. But the fact of the matter is we have hundreds of thousands of commuters who are sick and tired of being passed up, being crowded like sardines into buses, being crowded on the SkyTrain, not being able to get home at night, not being able to go to a show, having SkyTrain stop, uh, not have enough C-bus, all sorts of not night bus service. There's all sorts of problems with our system here. And so that is, that is the key. That's the driver for those people, and those are the people we want to get out to vote. We're not trying to get 100% of the vote. We're trying to get uh, um, probably a bare majority of people to vote, and it's going to be overwhelmingly transit users who want to see a better system. So I think that is probably something in common with LA. Uh, the second question, the foundation for change, well, I think I've sort of addressed that. Uh, it's, it's, I think probably, the, Michael, the factor is that LA, because of the extraordinarily difficult rules and inability to raise money for transit any other way, it had to get there. I don't think we need to have it that bad before people would agree we need improvements. And Mario's question, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I do know a little bit about skewed questions on referendums. Yes, I do, actually. Uh, having, having started no BCHST, the question was yes to get rid of the BCHST. Um, so, uh, you know, I can only hope that the government wants it to be seen as a very fair and neutral and, and reasonable question. I think there's a whole bunch of different ways, you know, 
there was some suggestion from Mary Pollock, who was then the transportation minister, that it wouldn't be a yes-no question. Then Premier changed it, said, no, it will be a yes-no. You can vote against this. And so there is a real possibility it will be defeated, as opposed to just say, which way do you want to be poisoned? You're, you're going to have a choice um, in that sense, if that's the way you look at it. I think that the question needs to have some broader element of what the program is, as Denny said. If it just says, do you want to give $30 billion to TransLink, then we're screwed. And if it says, do you support raising funding through a variety of means to ensure massively wonderful utopian transit in your region, then we might win. Um, I certainly agree that the reputation of the implementing agency is a crucial part of winning the vote. Um, Having said that, L.A. Metro had what I would call a rehabilitated reputation at the moment of the vote and not long before, just a matter of a few years, was in loads of trouble with, with, with the electorate. And they had, I think, I think uh, with some smart decisions um, and change in leadership, they had um, transformed um, their, their, their reputation. And a lot is about, you know, frankly, to voters, not all, you know, the 10 percent uh, mode split for transit during peak hours. So most people see the buses on the road. And so how the buses look and how they operate matter, really matters to voters. And so Metro had to rehabilitate its image. Um, second, um, the second thing is, uh, while it's true that's, that, I, as I characterize it, L.A.'s was getting at this sort of gridlock moment, it's also true that we need a two-thirds vote. Um, and so, it's, and I think as Bill said, that's one of the reasons why we hadn't had a measure for 20 years is because two-thirds was just such a high bar um, that it really took very severe uh, conditions really to get political leaders to agree to put the measure before uh, the voters. Political leaders are afraid of being associated with defeat, unfortunately, but they are. And so, you know, grounds for confidence is important um, to, to move forward, and um, especially when you need two-thirds vote. But we did not have a 7% sales tax. I mean, oh, my God. If we did a 7% sales tax, 37% of the I mean, you know, if that, it's, you know, we had a half-cent sales tax. In other words, it's a larger population base. But, um, you know, smaller increments matter. Um, and I think it's also possible to succeed in a series of small increments where you're, where you're defining, and you might even consider this, where you're defining each of the measures fairly sharply, uh, and I mean down to the specific projects. Uh, so Wilshire, Subway, you don't have Wilshire, but you know, Broadway, so, what, you have a Broadway Subway. We so, do. We do. We, we, um, we may. Right. So, uh, you know, there's a high level of specificity as people know what they're voting on, but proceed with, with uh, uh, modest increments and not trying to solve all of your problems once and for all at this moment. Okay. Let's go with the next three. I have one here, one down here, and one there. Okay. We're going to go really quickly with these questions and see if we can get more in. Hi. My name is Eric Doherty, and I want to um, get you both to expound on what um, Bill – uh, said about uh, transit cannot be soft sold to drivers. Uh, about going positive about uh, transit's effect on reducing air pollution, opportunities for drivers to leave their cars at home, reducing congestion, and con contrast that to what TransLink has been doing, at least in the past, of every time they were challenged on the benefits of transit for drivers or TransLink for drivers, harping on some road expansion project, some small road expansion project, like their um, expansion of the Fraser Highway, adding a few lanes in a few places. Thank you. Hi, I'm Graham Anderson. Um, I've got a question about funding in LA, and I'm, I'm curious, with that broad, broad and impressive coalition, uh, what your sources of funding ultimately were, uh, the timeline for that, and uh, $4 million being the final budget, how much of that came early and how much was really the final push for advertising? Um, yeah, and just the breakdown between labor, business, and, and smaller individual donations would be very interesting. Thanks. And one down here. I didn't forget you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a two-pronged question. I don't know if that's allowed, but they're sort of short. Um, how to get earned media, any tips, and how to get people out to vote? 
All right. You want to start, Dan? Sure. Um, I mean, L.A. County is overwhelmingly drivers, right? I mean, it's 10 percent of the uh, of the of the commuters at peak hour are on transit. 90 percent are not. Um, so no, any measure that needs two-thirds better make a damn good case to drivers that they're beneficiaries or it's doomed. Um, and I, evidently, the case was made. And the case was made to drivers on, um, on I think, several fronts. One was, of course, traffic congestion. Of course, traffic congestion. Another would be, however, economic development and job creation. A third would be um, safety, like bridges and, and issues that were and, – and there had been some falling bridges around the U.S. Uh, during that – in the period prior. So um, uh, that was important. Um, and the fourth, I guess, is having choices. Um, and, it, and that isn't going to appeal to a broad swath, but it does appeal to a significant swath of, of the drivers. So there are multiple ways in which, in which you can appeal to their self-interest. Um, and the fact that the program has fairly sharp definition in terms of, like, the Wilshire subway, the Expo light rail, the green line to Redondo Beach, the, you know, that, that fairly high definition in each region, um, I think, allowed voters, drivers, mostly drivers, in each of those regions to anticipate Life would be better, and after all, the cost is really low. It's about 25 cents a day for a half-cent sales tax. So uh, I think that case was made then. The fact that we won again, or not won, we got 66% again, I think sh showed us a lot of it had been internalized as well. There was a, there was a, a kind of zeitgeist shift where people who were drivers began to appreciate transit as an advantage for them as well. Um, sources of funding... Um, measure R and Measure J all happened like boom, like um, they weren't the long buildup where you could really raise money over time, um, in part because you had to wait for the legislature to adopt authorizing legislation, and that was like six weeks, eight weeks before election day, because <laughs> le legislatures have they you know drag things out, give it an opportunity, they will. And they did. So you really had just a couple months to pull together the funding. And, you know, 80 percent of that is Antonio on the phone. About a third is labor. About a third is uh, major business entities. And about a third is uh, its major cultural uh, patrons. Uh, L.A. County Museum of Art Foundation was the largest contributor. They contributed $900,000 because there was going to be a subway stop on the corner of Wilshire and Fairfax right where the museum was. And for the patrons of the arts, right, you know, putting money into a public pool that can really yield yeah. a much a multi-million dollar um, outcome for them is more cost effective than is given it to the museum's capital pool itself. Someone here from the art gallery by any chance? Um. <laughs> Well, this is not, I mean, no, you know, I like it. wealth, uh, a lot of people with wealth, you know, think a lot about, you know, we can't spend it all. Mm -hmm. So what is it I want my legacy to be in art and culture and stuff? Very often. And so access to art and culture for the public is very often something they really deeply care about. And so having a system that serves cultural facilities can be a big winner in that community. Um, I won't obviously that's address that one uh, on the last question. How do you get earned media? I, I always advise hiring a good communications consultant um, <laughs> I know one um, I Think you have to be very creative actually. There's a lot of different things to do. We, we did all sorts of crazy stuff during the HST campaign including the uh, MLA survivor island stunt where we actually decided who would be voted off the island with a recall campaign first. And there was a lot of outrage on it, but we were in the media constantly. And uh, certainly the Liberal caucus didn't like it, but it was kind of funny. Um, and it, just doing constant things like that. On the get out the vote, it, we don't know how the referendum's going to go. One of the big advantages I didn't mention for the HST is it wasn't a single-day standalone ballot where you had to get people out all at once because we didn't have the machine to get out the vote. 
uh, we had lots of volunteers, but we didn't have an NDP or a BC Liberal or Federal Conservative machine and all the money for phone banks and everything else. So we had a ballot, which was a mail-in ballot, and it took place over, uh, actually it was almost two months because there was a postal dispute. So that gave us a lot more time to make sure people were out voting because we just didn't have that kind of a instantaneous resource. So if I had my choice, uh, I don't think it's absolutely critical, but I would prefer a mail-in ballot over uh, six weeks than a single vote during the municipal election. But if the municipal mayors and councils are all supportive of this and they're encouraging their supporters to come out and vote, then it could, uh, it could get over that as well. Um, on Eric's question on the drivers and the referendum, I'm not saying to go out and antagonize drivers, and I think there clearly will be measures that will support improved transportation for drivers. I'm just saying that you have to look at uh, municipal elections, if it is a municipal election, and even every election, is a low turnout, and so, and particularly in municipal elections. So we're trying to make sure we maximize the commuters, the transit users, existing transit users, part-time transit users, would-be transit users, maximize their vote in whatever format the referendum is and uh, just not worry as much about it. But if, if every driver in, in the Metro Vancouver area decides this is a bad idea, then it will lose for sure. Okay, next three questions. Do we have any more? Okay, one, go here. Anyone else? Will I do this? One question here. Okay, two, anything else? Okay, I'm gonna actually ask one then if there's a break. Mine's actually a segue from that last one. I'm Erin Oble and I'm with Hub Recycling Connection, but we obviously see benefit in all of the different modes of transportation being healthy in this region. It's around the timing and the medium of the election. I have heard that some mayors here are not keen to have the referendum along with the municipal election because they don't want issues confused um, or that to be the, the top priority perceived. And so I want to know both of your thoughts because um, Denny, you, you talked a lot about getting the vote out and having it with important elections. So my understanding is that you think it's good to have it with an election and not as its own question. I'd love to hear more about that. And if anybody in the room knows, um, if there's any leaning towards the timing as an update and the method that it'll be delivered, whether it's um, even possibly going to be a mail-in um, uh, vote or if it will certainly be an in-person or if there's any other options on the table. Hi, I had a, a similar question, um, but um, you know, reading the uh, local papers around Metro Vancouver, there's a very uh, stark difference between the editorials you see in the Langley Times versus uh, in uh, the papers in uh, Vancouver proper. But um, I, I'm wondering if you know if the question is vague, if it doesn't refer to specific projects that will. Uh, do you help with the problem of the Fraser? How is it possible to get support in those areas? I'm going to ask one question here, and that is, Bill, you used the term value proposition. I know it's soon, and it's before we have a question. Are you able to articulate what the value proposition is here for this referendum? <laughs> is that the third? Okay, now we're on to all three. I'll think about that one for a minute. Um, well, uh, I think some mayors don't want to, being blunt, as people will know me to be, uh, I think some mayors don't want to have any um, forced situation where they actually have to take a position on the referendum. They'd rather just avoid it to some degree, and you know, they, they don't want to they don't want to tie their electoral chances to a referendum because they not they're not sure yet. And fair enough, they're not sure yet what the question is or when the timing is. Um, but uh, in terms of the uh, at the municipal election, uh, you know, the turnout for the HST referendum was the same as the turnout in the election, basically. Uh, a mail-in ballot got the same turnout as, as the 2000, 2009, 2000, yeah, 2009 election. And so uh, you can't really say one is better or worse than the other, except that we know municipal elections will be lower. Uh, how you get around the regional differences, I mean, I, again, being blunt, uh, Vancouver and Surrey have way more votes than Langley. So everyone in Langley can vote against this, and if Anchor and Surrey votes overwhelmingly in favor, it won't matter, unless it has some sort of a super ballot question where you have to get 50% of the support in every municipality, in which case we'll be worse off than L.A. Um, in terms of getting anything through. I, I don't think that's the case. I think it's going to be one person, one vote in the whole region, but it still has to have that balance that Denny's talked about in L.A. County. 
Uh, on this, uh, yeah, big question. Yeah, I think it's a real challenge. The question is, we can talk to Mario Canseco about this, that the challenge is really going to be enormous on this question because uh, it can't be an 800-word question, and it has to be somewhat specific uh, on, on the actual program. The value proposition, uh, you know, it's like a ballot question in a way. I think it has to be that this is a step that for relatively little cost will improve our quality of life for decades to come, something along those lines. You know, I think uh, that there is, this is much more hopeful um, a situation than I've heard some suggest. The reason I think that, I mean, the idea that the L.A. Area Chamber of Commerce and the L.A. County Federal Federation of Labor would, in effect, co-sponsor a measure uh, was unheard of before. I mean, they were overtly antagonistic on many other measures, on many other political, and certainly very much so on you know, who should be elected to office, et cetera. Um, that's a very hopeful sign. It means, really, that, that there is broad understanding that investment in infrastructure accrues to the benefit of all in the community um, and is and, and in gener and generally so if the system is itself sort of uh, broadly shared, if its investments in, in fact are inclusive. Uh, so I think if what, from what I've heard from people about the political environment you're in here, um, I think the, you know, what constitutes a good system a desirable outcome is not uh, a you know it's not a wrenching debate. There there are there's fairly broad consensus among the political leadership and sort of both major parties. It seems to me about um, you know the need for transit and that's an important objective and that it would benefit our economy, etc. So in a certain level, while they're tactically um, divided about measures when, what have you, how's it going to affect my election, and the sort of, the sort of political uh, thing that electeds do. In terms of, in terms of their, their vision for the community, it sounds like there's more in common than there's not. And I think that is a force that will bring them together. I mean, the proposition that this may be a unique opportunity when we can come together and really do something special for all of British Columbia and this metropolitan area in particular, that's the proposition that should be articulated to them. And that's the expectation you should have, and that's the message you should, you should convey to them. Okay. I want to just check and see if there's any other questions. I'll come over to that side. I'm going to go with David here, and then I'll come over, and one more. And then I think this will be the last three. So um, one two, three. Hi, David Hendrickson. Uh, are there strategies to influence the wording of the question? Yes. Big question. We're going to come back to that. We're going to get the three on the table. Here you go, ahead. I should know this. I'm presuming this is a lower mainland referendum, not a province-wide. Okay. Yes. That was question easy. Question of clarify. That was an easy one. And there we go. I have an observation and I'll follow that up with, uh, with some questions. The observation is for, for Denny, and the, the, it's, I'm going to phrase it like a question. Which came first, uh, the donor list or the, um, the subway uh, station plan? <laughs> the subway station plan? Good. Now, this leads on to, to I mean, the other fact, question. I, I only hesitated because uh, I wondered what, of course, the subway station plan. It's, okay. It's not even, you know, it's driven by such larger fundamentals. Yes. So that leads right into the area that I want to get into. Who's got the clout to draw up for the, the greater Vancouver area a credible subway uh, rapid transit uh, scheme? Um, you mentioned, uh, um, uh, someone else did, that you had Siemens and other people of that, that stature in your group. Uh, how did you go about drawing up a credible uh, plan and costing it? 
Well, Siemens and others engineering companies would have had close to zero to do with uh, um, with that proposition. They uh, know that it's neither in their interest or in the interest of the proposition to be playing that role. Um, they don't always think that smartly. I think there are you know other examples where perhaps they get in, different companies get attached to a line in a project. But in general, I would say, um, in, in our case at least, no evidence of the, 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 the plan, the, the lines, et cetera, really came out of um, a system of councils of government, um, not unlike your council of mayors here, except it's, there are half a dozen of them around LA, councils of government, small cities that get together, elects get together, and they create their own sub-regional priorities. And you know, they were nursing all that as wish lists for the longest time, for 20 years, long before Measure R was really even a possibility. But you had that to draw upon when it came time. And you know, you basically, knowing that you have to get two-thirds, you, you have to go find uh, you know, solid, credible, significant projects in each of those councils of government if you're going to expect to succeed. Uh, well, in, in the case of those specific propositions, those specific projects, there would have been a metro-based analytic process, even in the broadest terms in some cases, um, um, going uh, forward. Although I have to, you know, mostly being done by depressed people who didn't ever think it was going to happen. <laughs> right, I mean, but analytic nevertheless. And suddenly, kaboom! It's on the table for a vote, and they're like, "Oh my God!" I have to deliver. Right. So, um, uh, yeah, that's 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 where it happened. And I think um, you know, you cost these things in fairly broad. You have to set up a, a certain amount of contingency and a flexible contingency fund, so that the, whoever the decision-making body is can allocate the contingency in some fashion where needs are. But you need to be fairly prescriptive in the measure about minimum budgets and minimum, uh, you know, length of lines from where to where, that sort of thing. People want to know what to expect. Do you want to talk about influencing the question? Influencing the question, um, that's a constituency organizing, you know. I mean, the metro mayors are powerful, but I doubt very much that if any of them really ever ran a campaign. They're the, right, they got consultants, right? They got, they're looking at constituencies. They're, they're not... Rarely are they the consultants and the organizers themselves. And so if they want to see it win, they want to see the constituencies that mobilize, that give that for the campaign, that influence the voters, et cetera, and what they're thinking. So, I mean, what we do now is we now in L.A. know that we are among the people that they look to. And so we're out working it, <coughs> finding ideas, working it. So there needs to be, I think, some kind of non-governmental entity that's working it and identifying best options, best, you know, doing the regional, you know, the agency itself, like Metro in L.A., in a sense, it is the recipient of priorities from the COGS and what have you, and it gives analytic stuff back, but it's not easy for them to go out into the San Gabriel Valley and say, this is what you need. Because San Gabriel Valley won't accept it, right? But, but nonprofit advocacy groups and people like that, we can go out and be you know, tillers of the soil and proposers of creative ideas and so on and conveners of constituencies. And we can affect the proposition. I expect that in the 2016 proposition, our fingerprints will be all over it. Uh, Peter Ladner, who's here, wrote a great column about the importance of this referendum, and he also pointed out that the business community has not publicly stepped up to the plate on this. And I think the, probably the biggest single influence that can happen on, on Premier Clark and Minister Stone is to have the business community and key people and sectors saying, we need this to pass, we need this to pass. And however it's structured and whatever the plan is, if the business community uh, goes to the government and says, please make sure that this is fair, and uh, if you're not going to support it, at least make sure it's neutral, your position on it, but hopefully you'll support it. Because if we could get, 
if we could get a, a labor, business, liberal, NDP, conservative, green coalition all behind this, then the chances go up dramatically that we'll succeed. Uh, I, of course, will be nominated for the UN Peace Prize, but um, <laughs> that's a minor matter for me. Um, no, I think that it's possible to do that. I, I think at a minimum there's got to be an understanding that an unfair question would, would just really rebound back on those who propose it. So there, there's, a, there's a negative side to it as well. But um, it, it is a Solomon-like decision. A lot of people will be unhappy with the question no matter what you do with it. But I think you can make it um, certainly a majority winning question. And I think the business community has a key role to play in this one. I don't think anybody in your community will want to be identified uh, in some fashion as responsible for defeat. Other than Jordan Bates. <laughs> There may be some, Denny. <laughs> I want to end by asking each of you to give us your best, best advice of our next steps, the first two things that we need to do now. Well, I would say that you need to treat this now as not as an, oh, my God, fait accompli, but rather as an opportunity. Um, and uh, put your most... Uh, you know, faithful community advocate hat on and expect the best of your leaders. Um, challenge them to give the best, like Bill said, a proposition that's winnable, structured in a fashion that's uh, an election where the turnout can be sufficient to ensure that, and a program that's truly in the interest of, of uh, the region. Um, and create that high expectation that what we're looking for you to do is come together on this and not have this be a political football between the major political parties. That Be the third party in that question. Um, there's an old saying, I can't remember exactly, but it, it goes that the best decisions are ones where after they're made, they appear that they were always inevitable. And I think that transit funding is, should be a decision which appears after the fact, after this referendum is passed, that it was inevitable and that it was obvious it had to happen, even though we don't feel that way right now. Um, so I echo what Denny says. I think we have to redefine the whole circumstance. I think there is some antagonism towards transit funding. Uh, it's it's a, definitely a major challenge of diplomacy because we have mayors who don't get along. We have interregional disputes. We have interparty disputes within the province et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think that transit, public transit, and improving, not just transit, it's not just about public transit, it's about improving our economy. It's ensuring that our economy functions in a modern society. And if people can look at that as opposed to the, the more narrow interests and come together as they have in LA around that, then we will be successful. I want to say a very, very big thank you. I think that my learning has gone up incredibly over the course of the last hour and a half and I want to say a big big thank you and for the questions I thought what a group of great questions so thanks very much I want to say also a thank you we have uh, our North Growth Foundation has been one of the funders of Carbon Talks uh, Paci uh, Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions as well as one of our funders and SFU so I want to say a big thank you to them and to some of the funders of the Moving in a Livable Region who are inside the the um, audience today, uh, certainly TransLink and the BC Real Estate Foundation among them. I want to let you know that there are going to be other Carbon Talks coming up at the end of October. It's the business case for LNG. We're going to look at that. At the end of November, we're going to have Rob Abbott from Carbon Neutral Government and the BC Climate Action Secretariat looking at reducing emissions in BC transportation. So again, another transportation related. And in December, we're going to be speaking about Kinder Morgan's pipeline. So some big issues uh, through the next. Take a look at the Carbon Talks website to keep in, in touch on all of those. And uh, I want to end by saying thank you to all of you, to the two of you. And um, I hope we uh, win this referendum. So thanks for your help in, 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 we'll in getting us started. LA. Thank you.